This year's lecture series is titled The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, Myths, Images and Imaginings about Jews. And our lectures explore the complex connections and entanglements between visual narratives and ideas of beauty, ugliness and morality that are inherent to representations of Jews and Jewishness in the Western world. The topical range of this year's contributions is very wide, and we aim to examine the subject from different historical, social and artistic perspectives, ranging from medieval mythology to Orientalism, Zionism and feminism, just to name a few. Our speakers will explore a selection of diverse media such as painting, photography, film and comics, and of course, literature as well, and superficially, one might think that in these media, ideas about beauty and ugliness appear to refer to physical markers. The aesthetic categories that a society creates around those are, however, always highly political vehicles to translate ideas about bodies into devices to navigate ideas about morality. Ultimately, all the myths, images, and imaginings about Jews that we'll engage with here have been applied in the negotiation of inclusion and exclusion, or in other words, in many dynamic ways in finding who is part of either the good, the bad, or the ugly. Tonight's lecture will explore a specific manifestation of beauty and virtue, reflecting about the figure of the virtuous Jewess in 19th century British literature. So, as I mentioned before, we're extremely honored um, to welcome Professor Nadia Warman tonight, and let me now introduce her briefly. Nadia Warman's academic work in the field of Jewish history and culture is seminal in many respects, and it stands out for her award-winning contributions in making British Jewish and migrant history visible in public spaces, particularly in London's East End. It is indeed very hard to reduce her diverse academic output into a few short opening words. So please forgive me, Nadia, and please forgive me, dear guests, if I can only give a very condensed overview today, scratching the surface. Nadia Valman is Professor of Urban Literature at Queen Mary University of London, and she is a scholar of 19th and 20th century urban culture with special interests in religion, gender and migrancy. Her path in academia has taken her from studying English at the universities of Cambridge and Leeds to a doctorate at Queen Mary University of London. Before returning to Mile End, she taught for a decade at the University of Southampton. Nadia Valman's academic profile is unique in combining her innovative research on the representation of Jews in literature and popular culture with groundbreaking work in the translation of scholarly findings into accessible and attractive formats that make Jewish history and culture visible to the public. She has published widely on Jewish history and culture and has been leading in the compilation of several seminal edited volumes in Jewish studies, focusing on British Jewish women writers, contemporary Jewish cultures, and um, 19th century Jewish literature. Let me give you just three examples to illustrate Nadia's impressive research remit. The first one is the Routledge Handbook to Contemporary Jewish Cultures um, that she co-edited with, with Lawrence Roth um, and that was published by Routledge in 2014. It is a collection of essays that provides an excellent array of works and brings together theory and analysis of Jewish cultural practices across the globe. And of course, I must mention tonight Nadia Warman's first monograph, The Jewess in 19th Century British Literary Culture, that was published by Cambridge University Press in 2007. It presents an interesting reassessment of 19th century philo-Semitic literature in focusing on Jewish women's role in a wide range of literary texts. It engages with the figure of the Jewess as an embodiment of virtue um, sacrifice and sacrifice and reveals how hostility towards Jews was accompanied by pity, identification and desire. And last and certainly not least, I would like to mention Nadia Warman's broad academic expertise in translation into a wide range of highly innovative public engagement projects. And here I can spend the entire evening talking without 
any full stop, but I won't. So I've tried to focus on a few of her projects only. So she has developed a series of public walking tours based upon her research on Victorian literary texts, such as Jewish life in Whitechapel and Jewish and Asian encounters in the pre-war East End. In 2016, she collaborated with a Migration Museum project to produce migrant literature walks. These popular tours explore different London neighborhoods through the eyes of migrant writers. For this project, she won the Hawking Award for developing understanding of public engagement at Queen Mary. She was also involved in a collaborative project with the Jewish Museum and Soda Limited, contributing to the innovative mobile app Zangwill Spitalfields, a free downloadable walking guide in Spitalfields in, that illustrates Spitalfields in the 1890s that dwells on Israel Zangwill's famous novel Children of the, Children of the Ghetto from 1892. Nadia is currently leading the AHRC funded project making and remaking of the Jewish East End. And I really hope that we will have many more of these interesting productions that dwell on the intersection between academia and the public. And I was particularly thrilled to hear about a yet unnamed project, so I can't spill the beans here yet, um, that she's involved in at the moment, an intervention in art that will bring together Bengali and Jewish cultures in the East End in an installation at Tower Hamlet's archives. And I only just broke to the news tonight that it will be launched in July rather than in mid-June and it will be on display until September. So pencil it in and go and have a look, visit us in Mile End. Um, so as I said, I could easily keep talking and filling in the entire evening with um, the impressions of Nadia's work and the great interest that um, it has triggered for me to have a look and also my students who keep mentioning her Israel Zangwill app all the time. Um, but I'd rather hand over to her myself. So Nadia, the audience is all yours. I'm going to adjust this thing for you. And I'm looking forward to your talk. Hold on, we just have to get this moving on the virtuous Jewess. There you go. Thank you so much for that incredibly generous introduction. And um, thank you to everyone. I'm really honored to be here. <clears throat> And it's a pleasure for me to um, come back to this work, which is very dear to me and really was um, the, the, the beginning, the root of the research I'm doing now. Um, so um, I'm going to speak about literature in this talk and it, um, I hope it will intersect in really interesting ways with the other talks in this series, um, which are on different kinds of forms of visual um, images. I have some images, uh, for you as well, but I'm primarily going to be talking about narratives. 19th century literary culture has in recent years proved a rich resource for anti-Semitism studies. From Fagin in the 1830s to Svengali in the 1890s, research has uncovered the persistent threads of hostility to Jews that found expression in novels. And thanks to the work of Sander Gilman, we know how widely discourses of the diseased and degenerate Jewish body were disseminated through medical, sociological and literary texts in the period. What's equally striking about this scholarship, however, is its almost universal assumption that the Jew in the text is male. When Todd Engelman writes, for example, that the intellectual arsenal of European anti-Semitism can, can be reduced to, quote, a handful of accusations about Jewish character and behavior. Jews are malevolent, aggressive, sinister, self-seeking, avaricious, destructive, socially clannish, spiritually retrograde, physically disagreeable, and sexually overcharged. So the Jew in that description is always implicitly masculine. And perceptions of Jews are frequently seen as projections of anxieties about masculinity. As Gilman writes in The Jew's Body, his focus is on an image crucial to the very understanding of the Western image of the Jew, at least since the advent of Christianity, the male Jew, the body with the circumcised penis. Where the Jewish woman has been the object of study, masculinity is still the focus. So studies of the 19th century French Jewish actor Sarah Bernhard, for example, have been interested in the ways that her business acumen and her Jewishness 
were linked to cast her as a ma masculinized figure. And obviously she played up to that as well in this role as Hamlet. In a different context, scholars studying the image of the Jewish mother in a modern American popular and literary culture have analyzed her as a domineering emasculating figure produced by the uneasy imagination of the increasingly affluent but socially insecure post-war Jewish male. So all of these studies uh, reiterate the link between anti-Semitism and various historical crises of masculinity. And what that means is that Jewish cultural studies has tended to occlude the relationship between femininity and Jewishness, but also to elide the various and specific cultural contexts in which representation representations of Jews were produced. So that's going to be the subject of my paper today, um, to look at a, a very specific case um, of um, in which representations of Jews were produced. So I'm going to look very closely at the case of England in the 19th century, where a very different picture emerges. It's certainly the case that a number of literary texts include or even center on figures of male Jews who are, according to that stereotype, racially repellent, socially intrusive, politically subversive. What we also see is that those figures are invariably shadowed by images of Jewish women that are in every way the opposite. So that analysis of a European anti-Semitism by Sandra Gilman um, that doesn't quite fit this case, and nor do accounts of the dangerously alluring Belle Juive, the beautiful Jewess, the Orientalist stereotype that we see in 19th century French and German literature. But scholars have nevertheless been very eager to find instances of anti-Semitism in English culture, and as a result, they've ignored or all but ignored this crucial aspect of Semitic representations. So what I want to explore here is the flourishing in 19th century middle class culture of the figure of the virtuous Jewess. And one of the questions I want to ask is, what did she mean? What did she represent? The image of the good Jewess emerged in early Victorian England in the literary culture of Protestant evangelicalism, which underwent a dramatic revival in the decades following the French Revolution and the ascendancy of a pious and patriotic middle class. In evangelical theology, the Jews were accorded a uniquely privileged status, and evangelical approaches to the Jews were marked with a peculiar and intensity and ambivalence. Victorian evangelicalism reinvigorated the ideology of 17th century millenn millennialism. English evangelicals stressed not the rupture between Christianity and Judaism, but their identification with God's chosen people and especially with its Bible. Writers often um, evoked the familial relationship between Christians and Jews. Jews were said to be kindred as concerning the flesh of the savior himself or God's peculiar family. So there was this kind of affection and intimacy um, that was um, felt with, with Jews. Although at the same time, it coincided with a severe critique of Judaism as archaic, law-bound and corrupt. So rapprochement with Jews was sought with a view to their conversion. And evangelical, evangelicals pursued this with indefatigable vigor. So this, this slide that you're seeing here is a, um, an example of a of provincial uh, Jew society, a conversion society. There were many, many, many of these all over the country. It was a very, it was a very widespread and hu hugely supported movement. And in that vigor, evangelicals were mo motivated by an increasing preoccupation with eschatology, the prophecies of the end of days. And they saw the conversion of the Jews as a crucial step in hastening the second coming of Christ. Now, England, it was repeatedly argued, with a history of tolerance rather than persecution, had a special role to play in this project. And there was often an explicit anti-Catholic subtext to evangelical discussions of Jews. 
one that sought to ascribe the advent of an expansive Christianity to the Protestant Reformation and a uniquely tolerant atmosphere to modern England. So why am I saying all of this? Well, <laughs> evangelical ambivalence with regard to the Jews had a kind of rhetorical analog in their ideology of gender. So men in evangelical theology, ideology of gender, were regarded as inherently sinful and sullied by their contact with the world of work. But the figure of the domestic woman was highly venerated. The evangelical emphasis on the humanity of Christ, his sacrifice in the atonement, his meekness and humility, brought women into a closer identification with his mission. Women, who it was believed must submit to duty, could emulate Christ's sacrifice and thereby wield his redemptive power. An evangelical Christianity prescribed an exalted role for women through their influence on the public sphere. The emotionalism attributed to women brought them closer to God and to a more powerful embodiment of the evangelical appeal. And their inherent moral superiority conferred on them a key position in the crusade for national regeneration. Now, the cultural impact of this was huge. And in the 1830s and 40s, when this theological movement was really um, in its heyday, writing on the Jews, especially by evangelical women, proliferated. It was aimed at a female readership and often focused on the figure of the Jewess. In countless narrative fantasies about the Jews' desire for conversion, the Jewess appeared as inherently spiritual and ardent, and also as particularly oppressed by the archaic Jewish legal code, calling out for aid to her Christian sisters. So what I want to suggest then is that the Jewess figure was a metonym, a symbolic figure standing for, expressing the much bigger idea of Christianity's strange relationship with Judaism. What she did was she resolved the theo theological problem posed for Christianity by the Jews, which was the paradox of Judaism's simultaneous familiarity and distinctiveness. This paradox was embodied in the figure of the Jewess, who was formed by her Judaism, but longing for Christianity. So now I'm going, to say, I'm going to say a few words about how this really worked in practice. I'm going to look at the very detail of these kinds of texts. So let's look at one. Um, and let's look at the language and the symbolism at work in evangelical novels about the Jews. So this one is an example called uh, The Orphans of Lissau, published in 1830. And in this novel, um, or which is, I think, uh, also... It's supposed to be a memoir, so it's actually not supposed to be a novel at all. Um, the, um, the, the Jews, and this is published in the 1830s, um, in 1830, the Jews' double potential for, for both obduracy and salvation is quite clearly projected onto gender difference. So the author describes two Jewish children, Raphael and Gertrude. The boy is dark-eyed and energetic, while the girl is fair, blue-eyed and gentle. Now, for evangelical readers, these physical and psychological traits are loaded with significance. The Jewish male is energetic and disruptive, while the female is submissive and introspective. She blends in with her environment rather than standing out from it. The blue eyes of the Jewess are contrasted with the impenetrable black eyes of the Jewish boy. Her body and temperament, and also perhaps her Teutonic name, Gertrude, um, anticipate her destiny as a Christian proselyte. This gendered bifurcation of the figure of the Jew characteristically structures conversion literature. While the texts point repeatedly to the Jews as a troublesome and resistant presence, at the same time, they also invariably draw on the virtues ascribed to women to insist on the redeemable nature of the Jews. That is to say, they mobilize a strong strain of philo-Semitism. 
Evangelicals were also deeply concerned with the form and nature of conversion. And again, they used the idea of the difference between male and female Jews to map what they understood as the distinction between false and true piety. In a letter from a converted male Jew published in the Christian Ladies Friend and Family Repository, this is a, one of many, many journals uh, uh, produced by conversion societies in 1832, the narrator describes how his religious doubt was inaugurated by contemplating the irrational pedantry of Jewish law. When he began to read the New Testament, he writes, he compared it with Moses and the prophets and found that they corresponded in every respect. And eventually he came to the logical conclusion that the Christian religion must be the best because it, because it is generally professed by all civilized nations. However, the rest of the letter labors to disprove this motive for conversion. He declares, I found afterwards that it is not by philosophy and reasoning that a man is converted or that water baptizes him. It is the grace of God which converts a sinner and the Holy Ghost which baptizes him. And he understood this, he says, because finally in a moment of destitution and despair, Quote, involuntarily as it seemed, I called on the name of the Redeemer to strengthen me by his example of humility and patience, which he gave us while he walked in this world. So it was only through a spontaneous, non-rational and submissive need that the narrator realized his conversion had been confirmed. Now, evangelical writers associated the activities of reasoning, logical comparison, and measured decision-making as typically masculine. So what you see here is that the writer's masculine mind has impeded the ascent of his soul. In evangelical accounts of the proselytizing of Jewish women, such rationality is absent. Instead, there's an emphasis on the spiritual and effective components of religion. And persuasion happens without recourse to, or even need for, argumentative proofs. A letter to the Jewish Herald, another conversionist periodical in 1849, contained the narrative of Mrs. D, a woman who had been brought up in the Jewish religion. Later in life, she writes, she became the subject of many great and sore troubles, and be being ignorant of the only way to access to God, I was bowed down with continued sorrow. This emotional yearning was only relieved when she met two young ladies who, quote, conversed with me on the all important concerns of my never dying soul. So here, as in many other narratives, religion is shared between women and fulfills needs ascribed to them as women, human and emotional needs. Now, the trials of conversion supplied an inherently novelistic narrative. Jewish conversion autobiographies supposedly produced by Jewish women were a particularly popular subgenre. These texts follow a strict formula relating the spiritual rebellion of a Jewish daughter against her family and the persecutions she suffers as she courageously clings to her newfound faith. The story of Leela Ada, for example, published posthumously in the 1850s in a series of books by her, um, her editor, her so-called editor, um, the Reverend Osborne W. Trenary Hayway. Uh, this man was later prosecuted by his publishers for fraud. So um, I think <laughs> was the author. <laughs> um, these books uh, describe the heroine's disillusion uh, with her religious education, which had been based on the Talmud. And she describes this as an impure, stupid fabrication composed by fallen and sinful man. Um, she increasingly believed, um, she increasingly holds the strong opinion that the advent of the Messiah is probably near, and her instinctively, quote, simple, devout reading and study of thy holy word, the New Testament. In each of these apparently personal observations, we actually see some standard evangelical beliefs ascribed to the Jewess. The authority of the individual in scripture reading, so she uh, rejects her, her rabbinic education and uh, reads the Bible herself directly, um, her, apo her apocalyptic inclinations, and also the high value placed on female suffering as a religious virtue. 
In conversion texts, the Jewish woman is represented as not only particularly susceptible to conversion, but also particularly responsive to it. In Madame Brendler's Tales of a Jewess, published in 1838, the heroine reflects on her love for the Christian hero that, quote, a time will come when William shall see that a despised Jewess can love with all the fervor of a Christian. Ah, far more sincere and devoted is the love of a Jewess. So this idea of the exceptional ardor and exceptional suffering of the Jewess makes her in these texts the more enthusiastic Christian. In evangelical writing, the close identification between Jews and Christians that structured millennial thinking is repeatedly expressed in the fictive relationship between the Jewess and the Christian woman. And we can see that in this image, which is um, on, on the cover of my book, actually, but I think it's an extremely beautiful image. Um, and uh, this comes from another novel by Mrs. Webb Peplow, uh, Jula Merck, um, or The Converted Jewess, which is public, was published in 1849. And the novel ends with the tragic yet beautiful death um, of the heroine Zoraid. So this is her death scene that you're seeing here. Um, this, uh, this young woman who struggled against her family to convert to Christianity, but dies a happy martyr in the company of her Christian friend, Helena. And you can also see there the Bible lying on the bed between them. Evangelical writing frequently emphasized the effective affinities between Jewish and Christian women. It focused with intense identification on the story of the suffering of the Jewish proselyte at the hands of the Jews, the, her family, um, as well as her liberation frequ frequently by a Christian woman into what evangelicals named the religion of the heart. For the female readers of these novels, the figure of the Jewess had multiple functions. And I think this is really sort of what I'm most interested in is what was this doing for the readers um, of these novels? Um, and I think thinking about it, there are a number of things we can say or surmise about um, what was going on here for the readers. So the woman reader was exhorted in these texts to identify with the suffering of the Jewess as with Christ persecuted by the Jews. In the story of conversion, that reader could read an allegory of her own spiritual rebirth. But the story of the Jewess also spoke to her experience, not only as a Christian, but as a woman. In the narrative's frequent recommendation that the heroine turn away from the authority of fathers, husbands, and rabbis to the prophetic call of her own conscience, the reader could recognize her own sense of struggling moral righteousness. The rebellion of the Jewess also perhaps political discontents of women readers. While her submission to a higher authority cast that story within a safely orthodox conservative framework. The philo-Semitic representation of the Jewess then was a vehicle for the articula articulation of contending versions of middle-class femininity. And I think that's what um, the readers understood when they were, when they were you know, it, in their thousands, um, but buying and reading these novels. Conversion texts, like the voluntary societies from which they emanated, never achieved the goals of evangelization for which they ostensibly aimed. What they undoubtedly did affect, however, through their extraordinarily wide dissemination, was a deep and lasting influence on literary representations of Jews, an influence which was to endure throughout the century in the writing of non-Jews and Jews alike. Indeed, the beautiful, virtuous and self-sacrificing Jewess resurfaced a number of times, sometimes in the most mainstream of places. So I'm going to spend the rest of this talk uh, talking about two examples, um, much more well-known examples than these um, fairly obscure <laughs> uh, popular novels of the 1830s. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Anthony Trollope's great satirical novel of 1875, The Way We Live Now. Now that novel is best known for its fantastically gruesome villain, the fraudulent railway, uh, railway loan financier, Augustus Melmot, who is probably a Jew. It's actually never said that he is a Jew, but um, he, he, it's suggested that he is. Melmot inhabits a decadent London society 
in which the aristocracy has gambled away its wealth, abandoned its feudal responsibilities, and shamelessly exploits the privilege of rank to obtain further credit from the commercial classes. Now, all the upper class men in the novel fail in their duties towards women, but Melmott fails most heinously of all in his cruel treatment of his only daughter, Marie, whom he cynically uses in an attempt to get his hands on English land. Now, Melmott's Jewish identity, as I said, is never really confirmed by the novel, but in a way we can see it as confirmed by his relationship with his daughter. And her miserable subjection suggests something which is now very, would have been very familiar to readers, um, the commonplace narrative of the Jewish woman's helpless suffering. So here's uh, an illustration from the original uh, printing of the novel um, where Melmot is threatening his daughter um, uh, with, with violence. So let's hear a bit more about Marie, M Marie Melmot, who's a, a kind of minor character in the novel who isn't normally talked about very much. But for me, really interesting, because um, in the same literary tradition that I've been talking about, Trollope's Jewess becomes the novel's key agent of redemption. So, so despite being a minor character, she plays a significant role in the story. Marie has Melmot's fortune settled on her and is willing to elope with it. And that act makes her resemble much more than... Um, I suppose, you know, most obviously of all, Shakespeare's Jessica, the daughter who runs off with her father's money. But the fortune has been set settled on her cynically by Melmot to protect his own interests. And therefore, that sort of cynicism and that abuse of his daughter puts uh, the relationship between Melmot and his daughter much more in the line of these stories about Jewesses that I've been talking about, the oppressed Jewish daughter. And indeed, she is long inured to, quote, alternately capricious and indifferent treatment by her father. But a turning point comes when Marie decides to accept a marriage offer from an impoverished aristocrat, Sir Felix. With this decision, she experiences a liberation from Melmot's world of material opulence, and her mind opens instead, the novel says, to fantasies which were bright with art and love rather than with gems and gold. The books she read, poor though they were, left something bright on her imagination. So you can see that that liberation happens to Marie, like all those literary forebears, through reading, through texts. In this case, romance reading. Um, and it helps her oppose that prevailing ethos of acquisitiveness. And she expresses herself through an embattled devotion to her lover. This, to me, also recalls these older narratives. She would be true to him, she says. They might chop her in pieces. Yes, she had said it before, and she would say it again. And all through the book, she says this. I, they can chop me into pieces. So she's, she's kind of inviting this um, imagination of violence against her, um, of, of martyrdom um, uh, as, as her destiny. The novel ends with Melmot's downfall, and one way to read this um, is, which is, uh, I think, typical way of reading the book, is that it is his all his own doing. Uh, he takes a step too far, and he by deciding to speculate not on railway shares but on English land to try to own English soil. That is the kind of step too far. Um, but in fact, it's Marie, with her enthusiasm for self-sacrifice, that is the crucial mo motor of the novel's plot. At the height of his ascendancy, when, as the novel says, the world, world worshipped Mr. Melmot, Marie alone is the only one to express her dissent. And she disrupts her father's power by refusing to let him marry her off to secure his own interests and, and prevent his prosecution for fraud. Nobody shall manage this matter for me, she says. I know what I'm about now, and I won't marry anybody just because it will suit papa. So that willingness to risk violence at his hands, that is what undermines his power. Thus, single-handedly, the rebellion and self-sacrifice of the Jewess triggers the downfall of the Jew. Marie's romantic imagination combats Melmot's amoral pragmatism. Her ardor stands against his artifice. In the role of the rebellious Jewish daughter, Marie not only resists 
the ambition of, of the Jewish male, but redeems it. For ultimately, she comes to accept her place in a preordained hierarchy. And in doing so, she plays a key role in the way that the novel, the whole novel, uh, finally restores social and political order. And at the end of the novel, she humbly renounces her claim on the English aristocracy, her beloved Sir Felix. Directing her sacrificial inclinations towards England itself, she recognizes her position as an imposter and voluntarily removes herself. So in The Way We Live Now, this is a novel that uh, really, I think, endeavours to reinvigorate the conservative values of feudal England, where Jews understand their subordinate place in society. Uh, this endeavour is crucially dependent on the figure of the Jewess. Like the converting Jewish heroines of early Victorian fiction, Marie symbolically resolves the problem of the Jews. Now, the Way We Live Now is certainly not the only novel of the period in which the figure of enterprising self-interest, which is frequently a Jew, is shadowed at the same time by a Jewess. And I see these as kind of secularized conversion narratives in which the Jewess is once again cast against the Jew as a force of salvation. The narrative highlighting her persecution by her family, her affinity for culture rather than wealth, and her critique of Jewish social and financial transgressions. So in that familiar story, we see revitalized the philo-Semitic literary tradition of the 1830s. And perhaps the most well-known of such texts is George Eliot's famously philo-Semitic novel, Daniel Deronda, published in 1876, just a year after Trollope's. So I'm going to spend a bit of time thinking about Daniel Deronda because um, it's such an important and a wonderful text, um, rich, and it richly rewrites um, a lot of what I've been talking about in, in, in all kinds of interesting multiple ways. So in many ways, it's got a lot in common with Trollope's novel. It diagnoses decadence, anomie, and moral hypocrisy at the heart of the mid-Victorian ruling class. Unlike Trollope, however, Eliot posits Judaism as a corrective to these ills, a proposition most art uh, uh, explicitly articulated in a series of philosophical discussions among working men in a London tavern. So, um, so ostensibly, Daniel Deronda sort of discusses the, the significance of the Jews and the future of the Jews uh, through a bunch of men talking about ideas. Um, I think that's partly true. And uh, it appears also as this 2002 BBC adaptation, which is actually very good, um, suggests um, that it appears to be about these three characters, Daniel, Gwendolyn and Grandcourt. Um, but I think that the argument, the key argument of the novel is actually advanced through these two characters, two Jewesses, uh, whose stories are at kind of at the uh, margins of the main plot of Daniel Deronda. One is an assimilated cosmopolitan, the other is a religious nationalist. They exist at the edges of the narrative, but are central to understanding its messages. So in her version of the story of the Jewess, Eliot, and it should be said that Eliot once wrote a very scathing novel about evangelical, uh, sorry, a scathing essay about evangelical novels, um, which uh, does not, which I'm, so I'm saying, so I think it's very clear she had read them. <laughs> uh, she knew what she was talking about. Um, and I think in her use of the figure of the Jewess in this, in this novel, she demonstrates striking debts to, as well as radical departures from, the tropes of that kind of fic fiction. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Daniel de Ronda is the adopted son of a baronet. And he is shameful about his birth um, because his birth is unknown. And this has bred in him a sympathy with outsiders and a particular interest in the history of the Jews. The key turning point in his story is his encounter with his previously unknown mother, the woman um, on the right of this uh, slide, who summons him to Genoa to tell him the story of her life. Also, to his astonishment, she discloses his true identity as a Jew. Now in the grip of terminal illness, 
Deronda's mother reveals herself as the Princess Halm Eberstein, formerly, formerly the opera singer Leonora Alcarizzi, who fled her restrictive family to devote her life to art. And here, I'm, very, I'm, I'm pretty sure Elliot was thinking of the French uh, Jewish actress Rachel, who came from a poor Jewish family and who um, Elliot saw act on the stage, um, and perhaps also of, of Sarah Bernhardt, um, although Sarah Bernhardt had a very different life to um, any of um, Elliot's uh, figures. So the Alcarizzi does a long monologue in the novel uh, telling her life story, and it represents one of Eliot's most passionate um, protests against the suppression of female vocation in Victorian society. The opera singer recalls the intractable clash of wills between herself and her father. He never comprehended me, she says, or if he did, he thought only of fettering me into obedience. I was to be what he called the Jewish woman, under pain of his curse. You can never imagine what it is to have a man's force of genius in you and yet to suffer the slavery of being a girl. However, it was in this context that she first learned to dissemble so well. When a woman's will is as strong as the man's who wants to govern her, half her strength must be concealment, she explains. I meant to have my will in the end, but I could only have it by seeming to obey. So Alcariz's genius as an actor is thus fostered by the constraint of patriarchal law. And this teaches her what the narrator calls her double consciousness. So her exceptional brilliance as an artist comes, in other words, directly out of the experience of being a Jewess or a rebellious Jewess, that is. Just as in early Victorian conversion literature, Judaism in Alcariz's account is masculinized. It is associated with a strict father, with obedience to law and obliviousness to female needs. For holding ambitions outside her father's destiny for her as a Jewish wife and mother, for longing for the wider world, Alcariz says, I was to be put in a frame and tortured. In this phrase, Alcarizzi identifies Judaism with the Inquisition. It's a rather highly ironic <laughs> um, uh, metaphor there, um, and with forced conversion. A life in theatre for her is a chance, she says, of escaping from the bondage of Judaism. And her double consciousness formed under the strain of that suffering is what transforms her life into great art. So here again, the Jewess liberates herself from the narrow world of Judaism into a life of the spirit, a secular spirit, of course, here. Now, this is surely one of the novel's most powerful scenes, sharp, impassioned, and thrilling. But despite its power, this argument, that a legalistic Judaism can be transcended by the universalism of art, this argument is not endorsed by the novel as a whole. For George Eliot does not regard the life of culture as necessarily redemptive. This is perhaps not what you might expect. But the art of the stage in particular for her is associated with gambling, with usury and prostitution. So the assimilated Jew Jewish actress in Daniel de Ronda is anything but a figure of redemption. Rather than standing in opposition to the ruthless individualism and cosmopolitanism, that are associated with commerce. She is in fact, a version of that very same set of ideas. So in contrast, the novel offers an alternative Jewess, the child actress, Myra Lapidoff, who is the other figure in this slide. Myra enters the narrative when she's rescued by Deronda from a suicide attempt, and as you can see her just about to drown herself in the Thames. Um, uh, having journeyed across Europe, in a fruitless search for her lost mother. Myra, in contrast to Alcarizzi, is not given to make great claims for herself. She's repeatedly described in diminutives. Her story begins from the opposite premise to Alcarizzi's. She's been unwillingly forced onto the stage by her impresario father. Yet Myra and the princess are mirror images of each other. Both are stories of female rebellion 
in which Judaism and art are counterposed against one another. Like al Karizi, Myra learns how to resist paternal domination from another woman, a landlady in one of their many lodgings, and she harbors a secret life with her Hebrew Bible and prayer books. Unlike al Karizi, Myra learns to counterfeit her feelings in resistance to her father. Whatever I felt most, she says, I took the most care to hide from him. Al-Kharizi abandons her father because of his narrow orthodoxy, and Myra flees the single-minded com single commercialism of her father. So both of these representations, both of these figures, Myra and Al-Kharizi, in this, Eliot is drawing on those tropes of conversion writing, but directing those two um, directing the, what they represent towards different ends. So Myra's narrative of her life offers an alternative account of Judaism, casting it not as a system of law, as al karizi does, but in the feminized language of emotion. She associates both Judaism and music with early childhood memories of hearing chanting and singing at the synagogue, and her mother, lovingly murmuring Hebrew hymns. In her later sadder exploited life, Jewish history figured similarly. She says, it comforted me to believe that my suffering was part of the affliction of my people, my part in the long song of mourning that has been going on through ages and ages. Myra's Judaism is mystified and pre-rational. It is, the novel says, of one fiber with her affections, and had never presented itself to her as a set of propositions. So here we have again an echo of that idea of religion as something that is affective and emotional and is really not about a rational argument um, reasoning. As Myra progresses towards martyrdom, she becomes like Zoraid or Nermi or Leela Ada, these um, early conversion heroines, she becomes a kind of a type of Christ. She describes her final agony of abandonment that preceded her attempt to kill herself like this. I wandered and wandered, inwardly crying to the most high from whom I should not flee in death more than in life, though I had no strong faith that he cared for me. The strength seemed departing from my soul. Deep below all my cries was the feeling that I was alone and forsaken. These elements of the conversion genre, which emphasize the suffering and submission of the Jewess, by which she is ennobled, made beautiful, made virtuous, made worthy of redemption. These uh, elements are linked, um, I'm going to argue, to the novel's conceptualizing of Jewish history, and they are also crucial to its broader political vision. So this is the last little bit I'm going to talk about to now. So that political vision is elaborated in the scenes following Daniel Deronda's attendance at a meeting of the Working Men's Philosophers Club at a London tavern. And at this meeting, Mordecai, a consumptive mystic, puts forward an argument for the revival of Jewish national consciousness. Another comrade art charges that the Jews are incapable of modernization. But Mordecai contends that rather their tenacity is heroic. He says they struggle to keep their place among the nations like heroes. Yea, when the hand was hacked off, they clung with the teeth. In Mordecai's vision, the restoration of Jewish nationality, quote, shall be a worthy fruit of the long anguish whereby our fathers maintained their separateness, refusing the ease of falsehood. Now, Daniel is intellectually persuaded by this argument, but crucially, he needs to be moved by its emotional power. And that happens when he witnesses Myra performing a song, Ode to Italy, by the, the, the Italian nationalist poet Leopardi. Some, so it, it, Eliot was very interested in, in Italian nationalism, and um, so she's kind of, you know, look, working these things together in the novel. The novel describes this song as a song of mourning and exile. When Italy sat like a disconsolate mother in chains, hiding her face on her knees and weeping. Now, 
those are really interesting words, I think, for, um, because they link that image of contemporary Italy and the, the um, campaign for the um, for it for Italian nationalism. Um, they link that with um, a more ancient imagery of exile, which is that of the biblical Jews in the Lamentations of Jeremiah. So what we get when Myra sings is a fusion of these two things. She fuses her own submission to persecution and her self-identification with Jewish history with the emerging nationalist politics of the period. Her individual story is given meaning by the debate, the political debate that Daniel's just witnessed. So for Daniel, Myra's suffering, self-sacrifice and faith have an end beyond herself, what he calls the heroic passion for nation. So the image of Italy that Myra sings about provides a model for the national restoration of the Jews too. When Daniel imagines saving this vulnerable but fervent Jewish waif, that act of salvation stands emblematically and prophetically for the future redemption of the Jewish nation. This is what he's feeling when he engages so profoundly with her. Um, now, Eliot, in her earlier writing, was very much associated with um, a kind of uh, commitment to cosmopolitanism. But by the 1870s, this is a, um, her last novel, I think, the very suddenly a late uh, um, writing of hers. Um, she was turning away from her earlier commitment to the idea of the religion of humanity and towards the idea of nationality and the protection of distinctive national characteristics. And we can really see this in the way she represents these two Jewesses, um, which illustrate two alternative futures for the Jews, one of cosmopolitanism and one of nationality. al karizi is arrested in an attitude of strife, reenacting the irreconcilable conflict between individual ambition and collective destiny between assimilation and ethnic loyalty, between universalism and particularism. And on the other hand, the self-abnegating Myra inspires the resolution of this conflict. So al karizi is a kind of figure of the discontents of the diaspora Jew. Myra is a figure for the submission to the higher idea of nationhood. And as I've argued, um, these stories of the oppression, rebellion, and suffering of the Jewess read like striking echoes of the tropes of evangelical fiction. In Eliot's hands, however, they become a complex political allegory, suggesting the route to national renewal, renewal for the Jews on the one hand ostensibly in this novel, but also for the English, which is also her concern implicitly in the novel as well. So these stories are really stories about the potential for English national, national renewal. Although the literary fantasy of the Jewess that I've been discussing had its origins in Christian discourse, it was not the sole preserve of Christian writers. Jewish writers were equally enthusiastic about the Jewess. In Amy Levy's novel, Reuben Sachs, published in 1888, for example, we see yet another version of the same trope. Levy's novel reflects the racial thinking of the period, and it's populated by a cast of ugly, degenerate Jewish males. Alone among them, to offer a ray of hope for the future of Anglo Jewry, is a Jewish woman, Judith Quixano, um, a Sephardic woman, should be said, um, whose blooming physical health and instinct for culture, she likes reading, um, go all of these things go tragically unrecognized by her materialistic society. So again, like earlier writers, Levy depicts her Jewess as redemptive, as transcending the Jewish world that limits her possibilities, but whose exceptional sensibility is formed precisely by that restriction. Beyond the literary realm, the image of the Jews as passive victims in need of sympathy and aid from their Christian brethren was often beneficial to Jews. Christian support for Jewish emancipation in the 19th century was frequently expressed in these terms in the public and parliamentary debates, and Jews themselves sought to promote such an image. In our own day, 
the notion of the Jewish people as both passive and redemptive has remained remarkably persistent and equally problematic. Indeed, the anti-Semitic literary stereotypes that are often taken to be representative of English culture in the 19th century were, it must be remembered, accompanied by frequent vocal displays of public support for the Jews. So the Damascus blood libel um, of case of nine, 1840 and the support for persecuted public support for persecuted Jews in the 1880s are the two most obvious examples in the 19th century. Considering the gendered nature of Jewish representations points to the same complexity. In English Jewish culture, sorry, in English culture of this period, I have been arguing, Jews were imagined as much in terms of desire and pity as fear and loathing. Rather than a denigrated masculinized figure, the Jewess was often, in fact, an idealized representation of femininity. And it is the image of the, the beautiful or virtuous Jewess, the, the Jew whose Judaism is not permanently inscribed on her body, who is never so utterly other, that reveals most dramatically the ambiguous and dynamic character of responses to Jews in England. Considered alongside the more well-known literary stereotypes of Fagin and Shylock, the image of a good Jewess demonstrates that Jews could function not simply as an other, but also simultaneously as an ideal self. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nadia, for your, for your talk. I hope this is working. Um, just for everyone in, in the room, but also um, our guests online, we now have time for a Q&A session for um, Nadia Walman, and we will note the names of the people in the room, if we know them, or just where, where you're sitting, if you have questions. And anyone who wants to ask a question online, please put your name in the chat, and we will call on you in, in order of um, appearance, so you can either ask your question or type it into the chat and we can read it out. So the um, Q&A session is opened and we're looking forward to hearing your questions. It's done, please. Thank you so much, um, Nadia. It was a wonderful talk and, and so thought provoking. I wondered if I could ask you a question really from where you almost ended with Amy Levy and Ruben Sachs and something which you touched on very briefly as you went past it, that Judith Quixano is Sephardic and the other women who are portrayed in, in Ruben Sachs are mainly Ashkenazim and, and, and they're given a much worse um, treatment, much more sort of um, held up as being examples of not just assimilated, but actually really quite vulgar um, Bayswater Jews versus her made of veil simplicity. Is, is, there, is there something which you can draw on from that sort of trajectory of the, the virtuous Jewess reappearing in that sort of more original form in the Sephardic, or how, how, would you, how would you describe that? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I mean, I think that um, there's been some research on um, the, the myth of Sephardic superiority in German, um, in German literature and German Jewish literature. So I think that um, the idea that, um, that Sephardic Jews had a kind of a more, a, a nobler lineage and um, were more ancient, um, I guess more cu culturally ancient and also actually had a, a, a more noble history of suffering and, and suffering for their faith. Um, I think many of those ideas um, seem to have been picked up in England in the 19th century as well. So um, Levy is able to mobilize that idea that um, the Sephardic family, we're talking about um, Amy Levy's novel, Reuben Sachs, which was published in 1888, 1889, um, and her heroine, Judith Quixano, comes from a Sephardic family. And in that novel, um, her father is a scholar. Her father is, um, has sort of brought her up to, to be refined and um, cultured. 
but he has no money. So they're poor, but they're they're refined and cultured. Um, however, that uh, that culture is is ignored by the society around them, um, which is a Jewish, uh, as you say, a vulgar um, um, sort of Arivist um, Jewish society of um, Ashkenazi um, second generation immigrants who've done well for themselves. So part of what Levy is saying, I think, is that uh, she she is she, the bit the novel is a big attack on on that on materialism among the Jewish community. Um, but she does that by way of suggesting that there is this alternative um, kind of um, 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 alternative version of Jewish history, which is Sephardic Jewish history. Um, and she also in that novel is um, makes quite a lot of a, a sort of ra an idea of racial superiority. So there is the idea that the Ashkenazi Jew is in in the in the um, yeah the, the kind of middle class Ashkenazi Jews are um, unhealthy. Um, they're nervous. Um, there um, uh, there are many um, there are many members of their of their community who ha who have mental health problems. Whereas um, Judith's family are very much in blooming health, beautiful, you know, physically beautiful, evidently um, you know, su superior in physical terms as well as in culture terms. So I think I would say that I think that um, she is drawing on um, this broader belief in the idea of Sephardic. Um, Sephardic cultural superiority, but she's merging it with a late 19th century um, Eng English kind of racial um, ideology, I suppose, in which um, the uh, it, it, Jewish Jewish society is degenerate. Jewish contemporary Jewish society is degenerate, but is you know has has this potential for redemption through the Sephardic. Um, Sephardim, the Sephardim within their midst, if only they are recognised fully. So, um, so I think, yeah, I think that's what she's doing. Um, and what happens in the course of the novel is that this uh, this message is um, ignored by the world that she represents in the novel, and that beautiful Judith is condemned because she has no money to a marriage, um, an unhappy marriage. Um, she loses. Trace she loses loses some um, connection with the Jewish community, um, and her beloved Reuben, who um, comes from the Safar from the Ashkenazi community um, and is full of ambition and hopes to do well for himself, ends up dying young um, of a weak heart and sort of manifests this kind of um, degeneracy. Um, so we see that sort of racial racial idea there again. Um, throughout the novel in these different ways. Thank you very much. Do we have, okay, we have one more question in the room. Um, yes. Thank you. Um, not so much, a, not so much a question, uh, but uh, an observation which may or may not be useful in the context of your discussion of this novel the orphans of lisa which of course i have not read um, you mentioned or you pointed out that uh, the name of the female protagonist gertrude was somewhat unusual and indeed it is of course not uh, a common uh, jewish name but i wonder whether there is a, a link here which the author may have been aware of to the uh, late 18th century, very popular novel all across Europe by the Swiss, the Swiss uh, pedagogic reformer Pestalozzi, Gertrude and Leinhardt, uh, which is also about a pair of siblings uh, and, and, and their sort of utopian uh, upbringing. This was certainly something that that was known all over Europe, and and I wonder whether there is either a deliberate or subconscious loan of that name, which otherwise doesn't seem to make much sense. But obviously, I haven't read it, so I don't know. Well, that's very fascinating. Is Gertrude in the in that novel also the kind of ideal, um, yeah. ideally educated yeah. child? Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's sort of associated with a kind of 
with the good. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, have have a look at it. I mean, it's it's it struck me that, uh, I mean, first it's twenty or thirty years ago than since I read it, so I'm, uh, <laughs> it's not very fresh in my mind. But I did read it at one point, um, uh, and the setup seems to be sort of analog, uh, so it might be worth uh, exploring. It may be a dead end. Uh, and, and the other thing, um, um, the way we live now, which I have read more recently, uh, I, I always thought that it was fairly obvious that, that Melmoth was, was Jewish, even though it's not said. I mean, isn't he, he said to hail from Frankfurt? <laughs> Uh, and and he has some clear Yiddishisms in 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 his in his manner of speaking. I seem to recall. But yes, it, it's not a very important aspect. But to the reader, even if it, if he's not given the label, it's it's it was fairly obvious that, that yeah he is sort of foreign in some un, uh, unclear way. But what's really interesting, if you look at those original the original illustration that I actually used as a slide here, you can see that he is not actually distinguished distinctly anything other than a Victorian gentleman. He he doesn't look any different. Um, so, and I think that's part, you know, that that is part of the way that the novel's thinking about his his Jewishness, which is that it's become something that's intangible, unrecognizable, uh, un, unidentifiable. And that's what makes him such a such a profound threat to England. So yeah. yeah. Good evening. My name is Abigail. I am very impressed with your lecture, and I'm going back to the character of uh, Gertrude. You presented uh, the, the aesthetic and the food, uh, nice literature as well. Uh, it appears that uh, the variables feminist and uh, conversion to Christianity was portrayed at the time of the, the, the memo, the memory, uh, it? it was a uh, memories, memoir, memoir. A memoir. memoir that's it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, supposedly a memoir. I don't yeah. think it really is a memoir, but yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so about that. Uh, I wanted to ask you if uh, the conversion was made through seduction uh, of Jew Jewess, and it, if later on it was applied for men as well. Um, so it, are you asking, is the is the narrative of conversion, um, so are they, are it, is that part of the story, that she's, she's converted in order to... Um, Follow a man. Is that is that what you're no, if, asking? No, if, if it was the case, the circumstances, and if it was applied the same way for men at the time outside the, the memoir. In in real life or in yes, books? Yes. <laughs> ah, oh, in real life. You see, real life is it's a very difficult one because I think that this my research suggests that there's not the there really wasn't very much conversion happening. Right. Um, so there was a lot of read publication, writing, and reading of these books by. Christian readers, but actually the campaign to try to convert Jews really didn't work because they weren't, they essentially weren't really interested and um, it was very difficult to convert them. So, um, but then the, nonetheless, people were, people who were involved in conversion still felt it was a very imperative um, task to, to in, endeavor for, to work towards. So you did see all these books being published, but um, the records of the London Conversion Society for Jews, for example, show that there were very few conversions that actually happened. Um, so I think that actually in the period before um, Jews were uh, um, had sort of equal civil and um, social rights with, with, with others, it, there was an incentive for people to convert, for Jews to convert um, if they were um, entering into marriages or if they were entering into societies um, but after that, after that change, there was very little incentive. And for poor people who were the main object of these of these conversion societies, there was very little incentive um, for them to convert unless they believed it. Um, so a few did, but most of them didn't. <laughs> so that was my understanding. So I am up to date. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have one question online from um, Sonia Collins. Hello, Sonia. <laughs> And um, she says, first of all, thank you so much for this excellent talk. You've spoken about some of the perceived mutability of the Jewess in terms of conversion narratives and not being physically marked by circumcision. I was wondering how Maria Edgeworth's Harrington might fit in with a sympathetic character who's raised as a Sephardic Jewess, but turns out not to be Jewish in reality. 
Mm, that's an excellent question. And I think that perhaps Mariah Edgeworth is the most interesting writer of all in this period um, because she is interested in all kinds of uh, very complex um, issues around Judaism, including the psychology of anti-Semitism and how it's used to um, control children, how it's how it sort of becomes a trauma uh, in later life. Very all kinds of interesting things like that. That's not what you're asking, but I just thought I'd say that. Um, but I think that um, she is really. Um, uh, I mean, this is a novel published in 1817, so it's really before any of this um, ideology of of race. So, in in her uh, in her period, um, a Jew can convert to be a Christian. A Christian can appear as a Jew. Um, all of these things are not marked. They're not permanent. There's nothing. Um, there's nothing that can't be changed by by will, by education. Um, by environment. So I think that she's actually presenting a very different um, concept about the, the, as you said, the mutability, the, you know, the, whether Jewishness is something that is inherent and marked and um, immutable um, or not. And she is um, certainly um, of, of the view, unlike all of these writers that I've been talking about today, that, um, that, um, neither Jewishness nor Christianity um, nor um, anything that we can that, that were later considered to be um, inherent differences um, are inherent differences. Okay. I have a question if I may. Um, <coughs> did you mark us? Sure. Yeah. Okay. May I go first? Thank you. Um, very rude, but I apologize anyway. Um, so I, I have a question and you have to forgive me for that, um, Nadia. I, I haven't read Daniel de Ronda, but I was, a treat ahead but of you. I was very enthusiastic <laughs> about the BBC adaptation. It is um, very fascinating. And I was wondering, you know, one pattern that I saw there, and I'm definitely going to read the book um, after watching it or re-watching it because I watched it when it, when it came out initially. Um, what about the relationship and basically Myra being the benchmark for Gwendolyn in virtue? I was mm. quite fascinated by that and by the strong visual language link to that. So Myra basically being the better English woman mm. in a way, even though she she's in a very specific context here. How, how does that work? Yes, that's a really good question. And I, I'm thinking I might be misremembering here because I saw it in 2002, which is uh, more than 20 years ago. Um, and I seem to remember that, that it rewrites the novel in, in so far as it makes the last scene, the marriage between Myra and Daniel, at which Gwendolyn attends. And, you know, sort of all characters turn up at the wedding, like it's Jane Austen or something. Um, whereas in the novel, these are two stories that are remain apart. And actually the story of uh, Gwendolyn, who is a member of the English upper, upper ruling classes, um, encounters Daniel, but um, her, her story diverges from his and um, cannot be, they can't, they can't be reconciled ultimately. Uh, so the, the, the um, I think perhaps the novel is underlining what you're suggesting here, that what Gwendolyn, what they're, put, what they're putting in front of Gwendolyn in that final marriage scene, the wedding scene is this ideal, um, uh, ideal virtuous womanhood, um, this model that um, she, as a reformed and self-conscious and self-reflective character by the end of the novel, um, can look to and um, admire. So I think that uh, it, the, the adaptation is perhaps underlining what is there in the novel, but not quite so, uh, not quite so clearly said. Um, or at least the novel is 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 maintaining some kind of uh, dissonance at the end, um, but the adaptation isn't. Just made me want to read it even more. <laughs> so, um... um, thank you. Um, I'm at a completely different angle. I've just been to a wonderful exhibition at the Petit Palais in Paris on Sahara Bernard, and what became mm. clear is and how multi-layered the representation of her and 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 on both sides of the channel were, and, and she clearly appealed to certain markets and different markets. And I'm just wondering in, about kind of the markets 
side of your, of your story and how far were these drugs used intentionally getting to a niche market became its mainstream um you, you mentioned some numbers but i would like more uh, to have some more information about this side. Mm, yes um well, I think that's a, an excellent question. It's absolutely the right question to ask. And I think really what I was interested in doing in this research is to try to see what the relationship between novels that we consider canonical now, such as George Eliot's Daniel de Ronda, Trollope's The Way We Live Now, uh, which were very much highbrow novels in their, in their time, um, you know, how really might they relate to something which was essentially a genre of popular literature that would never have been read by the same kinds of readers. So um, I think that what's interesting to me is that um, looking at the kind of publication numbers for evangelical novels, um, I mentioned a novel called Nair Me by Mrs. Webb Peplow, which uh, was published first published, I think, in 1849 and reprinted every year, almost every year throughout the century. So that would have been, you know, nearly 50 reprintings. So these were very, very um, widely disseminated. And, you know, if you look today, if you looked on um, a secondhand book dealer website, you would see many, many copies of these books. They're still around. So I think it's true that they were published in huge numbers. Um, and if you look at the kinds of um, incomes of conversion societies, so people would meet in their little small towns and have meetings and discuss the importance of the conversion of the Jews, and there would be collections, and you can see the amount of money that was coming in. Um, so this was what this was a widespread culture. And there were many aspects of middle-class evangelical culture that, including anti-slavery, that were very much popularized through liter through popular literature and through popular um, collective social activities. And I think that converting the Jews is one of those. So it's really, I suppose, my argument that um, while um, this, this is really how kind of tropes enter into a sense of, of, a, of a kind of um, it enter into the white, it broader consciousness is through many, many people being involved in them. So somebody like George Eliot was absolutely scathing about evangelical culture. Uh, she'd been brought up within it. She was scathing about popular literature, but she knew about it. So um, it's not surprising to me that she, you know, alongside reading Zionist theory, Moses Hess and, um, you know, Feuerbach and lots of kind of very high highbrow philosophy, she also was fully aware of these kinds of popular cultural tropes that we today we might, you know, it, uh, we might see television or film as a, as a sort of similar kind of um, medium. Um, so I think that um, th that is what we see. And then we see it sort of disseminated via something like George Eliot. Um, it you know, continues into the late 19th century. And so somebody like Amy Levy was would have read, um, she certainly wouldn't have read evangelical popular fiction, but she would have read George Eliot, she would have read Trollope. So I think that is how these ideas get uh, replicated, or reproduced. Do we have any more questions? Yes. yes. Of course, going on from what Bethany, Amy Davy was almost writing against George Eliot in some respects, and and really trying to, to, to balance against Daniel Deronda what she saw as a much more realistic portrayal of, of, of Jewish life in Britain. And, and while Daniel Deronda could come and redeem and save Myra, Reuben Sachs completely betrays and deserts Judith and then dies as a result, as you say. My question, I suppose, is, is as you come through to the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, and the this rise of a racial understanding and a nationhood rather than just a belief system and a faith begins to take hold. Does the virtuous Jewess disappear and just sort of morph into something else, or does the does the Jewess as a whole disappear? Mm. I mean, it is my sense that yes, actually, um, that the Jewess 
is a 19th century phenomenon um, that doesn't survive into the 20th century except through adaptations. I mean, there are endless adaptations of Ivanhoe, for example, or, and of Daniel Deronda by the BBC and, by, in, and in film. So those stories continue to be reproduced and um, continue to be popular. Um, but I mean, you know, one could say perhaps that James Joyce was um, playing around with the idea of the Jewess in Ulysses in Molly Bloom, who is um, Bloom's wife. Um, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Um, I think that that the, the particular idea of suffering and virtue seemed to me something that that doesn't last into the 20th and 21st century. Um, Although the suffering of the Jews more generally, you know, continues to be a, a, a very important trope in, in culture um, and, the, and, and kind of sympathy for the suffering of Jews um, as, it, as it's focused through the figure of the Jewess in the 19th century, it, it, doesn't, have a sim it doesn't really have a correlative um, beyond the 19th century, I think. Um, but it's an interesting question. I have to think about that more, actually. Okay, thank you very much. Just um, one last chance to ask a question for, for those who are online and for those who are in the room. Yes, the gentleman in the back. Thank you very much. I have a, um, a social historian kind of question, I guess. Um, and that is uh, because you outlined uh, all this uh, literary imaginary, I was wondering, if you have stumbled across a missionary society which ever, which actually acted upon these ideas, um, for example, this um, evangelical uh, society with this incredible name, Society for the Promotion of Christianity Amongst the Jews, I assume you're familiar with it, uh, which was heavily influenced by evangelical thought. So I was wondering if, if they had like a um, special line of attack for poor women. That's an excellent question. Um, the way I would answer that, I think, is that um, if you go to um, Christchurch Spitalfields, which is a beautiful Hawksmoor church in Spitalfields, and if you go to the um, porch of that por porch of that church, there are um, a number of memorials there to um, um, operatives of the of the London Society for Promot Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews which had its church in Bethnal Green quite near there. And the church was, um, I'm, I'm not sure the church was discontinued and they moved the memorials to Christ Church. And there you can see that, that the um, people memorialized are all men. So um, actually the missionaries, and as far as I know, the missionaries who are written about are all male missionaries. So, I think I would say that the stories about Jewesses and converting Jewesses um, help raise money from women readers and the women who um, populated auxiliary societies. But the actual work of the conversion efforts was um, was a male uh, work and it mostly targeted men. In a short follow, but you mentioned that they weren't very successful in conversion, converting Jews. So did they ever like uh, reflect upon why and did the image of the Jews come up? Um, well, they sort of narrativize why all the time um, already, because um, in the stories, Jews are you know very are very resistant. Um, so they they expect Jews to be resistant to conversion. So it's not surprising when they are. Um, but this does not seem to make any difference to the um, to the efforts which continue really until the end of the century, actually the end of the 19th century. So um, I, I think that um, it's a, it is a self-fulfilling narrative in a way, which is the, the resistance and obduracy and um, yeah, resistance of Jews to Christianity is something that uh, they expect to encounter. Okay, so no more questions. 
online and no more questions in the room. I would like to say thank you so much, Nadia, for this really wonderful and inspiring talk that will hopefully send us all to our Kindles typing wildly the next titles that we want to read. Um, and thank you, everyone, for the wonderful questions and for joining us tonight. There will be a wine reception in the room next door, um, hosted by the German Historical Institute. And um, I would also like to say thank you, of course, to the German Historical Institute, but also to the team at the Leo Beck Institute London, Karina Rowe and, and Clara, and um, those who have really helped to make this event happen in such an intricate, hybrid manner, which takes us right into the 21st century and makes it possible for people in their living rooms to listen to wonderful talks like Nadia's presentation. So please do join us. And I would also like to announce the next lecture series, which will be um, on the 8th of June, where Professor Sarah Lipton will talk about Mark Toth in the eyes of the public, anti-Jewish imagery, and the politics of prejudice. Thank you so much. And please do join us for, for a glass of wine in the room next door if you have time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm.